Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcasting Network. I'm Joe Kent, Vice President of Research at the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. I'm filling in for Dr. Kaylee Iakina, he's president of the organization. And the Grassroot Institute is a nonprofit think tank that works to advance individual liberty, economic freedom, and accountable government in the state. And my guest today is Aaron Leaf. He's a researcher at the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. Welcome, Aaron. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, and thank you for being here. Um, and today we're going to talk about a very uh, uh, wonky topic, but I hope it doesn't uh, wonk you out too much. This is a topic about privatization and public-private partnerships. Uh, but before we go get to that, I want to learn a little bit more about your background, Aaron. Uh, you're a researcher at Grassroot, uh, but where are you from? So I was uh, born on Kauai um, just before Hurricane Aniki hit, so my family moved here after that. Uh, I graduated from Radford, and I was in the military as an intelligence analyst, uh, got my bachelor's in nursing at HPU, and now I'm here. Oh, okay. And so you're studying nursing, uh, you've got uh, military intelligence, and you've decided to work at the... What, what inspired you to want to uh, work at the Grassroot Institute? Uh, I was learning about just free market ideas, mm -hmm. uh, and my professor at the time, Ken Schoolin, uh, introduced me to the Grassroot Organization, and that's how I became involved. Okay. Well, economist Ken Schoolin is one of our dear friends at Grassroot. Um, and he is an advocate for uh, public-private partnerships and privatization efforts. So this public-private partner, there's a lot of P's in this uh, title, but what is a public-private partnership? All right, so to keep it simple, a public-private partnership is when the government works with a private entity to provide a public service. Okay, so um, governments can do things, uh, private companies can do things, and this is when uh, the two work together. Now, is that always a good thing when government and businesses work together? Well, generally, I believe that public-private partnerships are great because they bring competition mm -hmm. into the government, which oftentimes there's not a lot of competition, and that competition breeds innovation and drives down prices. Okay, so there's good things to public-private partnerships. Sometimes, though, there could also be bad things to public-private partnerships, uh, maybe if Business and government gets too close, for example, yeah. let's say uh, a back room where there's too much cigar smoking and, uh, and maybe there's some special deal or something. So uh, what's the difference between good public-private partnerships and bad public-private partnerships, would you say? Well, I guess uh, what you would want to make sure you don't have all that mm -hmm. handshaking would be to have a system that encourages competition where multiple businesses have to compete based off of their merit. The best man for the job. Exactly. And if there's uh, someone who's working with the government and has a partnership, and maybe a, a competitor comes along and says, I can do it for better, faster, cheaper, and everything, then they should have the right to, uh, to compete. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. So why, do, um, we, why are you interested in public-private partnerships? Well, uh, like I said before, mm -hmm. uh, I really like the, the competition factor. So in the private sector, mm -hmm. uh, if companies want to keep their customers, they have to make sure they can provide the best service at the best price compared to another company that might do the same thing. Okay. Um, however, in government, the customers are the taxpayers, and we have to pay our taxes no matter what unless we want to leave Hawaii. We got a captive audience. Right. They can't leave. So there's not as much incentive to have that competition uh, because we're going to be paying no matter what. I see. So what you're saying is that uh, private companies, um, costs often go down because of this competition, and the quality goes up. But in government, that's often reversed. The costs often raise, and the quality goes down. Exactly. And why is that again? Why, why is it that government, um, I, I don't know if you would say they do a bad job, but... Um, maybe they, their, their costs go up and the quality goes down often compared to the, the private uh, sector. Why, why is that? Well, I would say that uh, in government, you know, of course they're going to say, the policies will say, oh, you should try to spend less money, you mm -hmm. should be trying to innovate as, let's say, the Department of Waste Management trash collection. So they can tell the, the agency, you guys need to save money, but at the end of the day, even if they don't do their best work, 
uh, they're still going to have the contract the next year because they're the only ones I allowed see. to pro provide that service. So when a, a, a private company does a poor job, they go out of business because the competitor does it better, faster, cheaper, and everything. Right. When a government does a poor job, they don't go out of business. They Maybe they, they get a higher budget. Is they, that what you're saying? They might raise taxes to get, and they'll get more money because they weren't doing that well. I see. And so that's a public-private partnership we're talking about, uh, some of the benefits of it. But what about uh, privatization? Now, I think a public-private partnership is a form of privatization, but, um, but there is such a thing as 100 percent privatization. Well, what's the difference here? We've got the public-private partnership model, and we've got the privatization model. What's right. the difference? So privatization uh, and public P P3, we'll okay. say, P3, P3. <laughs> uh, okay. the, the difference is ownership. In P3, the government still owns that. The private company, although they may, they may manage it or they may help with operations, they don't own it. The mm. government still retains ownership. In privatization, the government no longer owns whatever that service that is being provided. That's the private sectors now. I see. So um, I visited uh, a town um, called Sandy Springs in Georgia, and uh, they uh, did a public-private partnership with almost all of their government agencies. Um, you know, they had the licensing department, the building codes, uh, the water department, the traffic department, all owned by the government run by a private company, and that would be under the P3 public-private partnership model. Correct. Because the government owns all those things, and they're just managed by a, a, a company. Exactly. Whereas in a privatization model, it, it would be basically 100 percent kind of sold off to the private sector. Is that right? Right. Okay. Got it. Okay. Well, what are some examples then in Hawaii? I mean, do we have any examples of public-private partnerships? Well. We don't have many, but uh, a recent one that a lot of people might have heard about, um, the three Maui County hospitals mm -hmm. uh, in 2015, I believe, um, began their transition to private management. So they're still owned by the government. Okay. They're just managed by a private company now. The government owns the hospitals. Correct. And a private company, what company is that? It's Kaiser. Kaiser Permanente manages those hospitals. Right. And that helps with the cost overruns and the quality? Correct. So what, what kind of costs are we talking about here? Uh, so uh, in the case of the Maui hospitals, I believe they're saving about $45 million a year. Mm -hmm. So that's significant uh, amount of savings that we could see in yeah. that uh, effort. So that sounds uh, very good. It sounds like, well, maybe we should look elsewhere uh, across the state to see what can we privatize. But. Uh, but that's not so easy, you found, right? Nope, not quite. So why, why is it, uh, are there hurdles in the way? What's stopping the P3 efforts? There, there's a very specific barrier um, known as, uh, it, it was the Kono versus the County of Hawaii court case, but it's referred to by politicians here as the Kono decision. The Kono decision sounds like uh, the, the title of a John Grisham novel or something like that. Okay, so the Kono, what is this, the Kono decision? What does that mean? So the court ruling, uh, it was basically on the, on the Big Island, um, they were opening up a new waste management plant. Okay. And the mayor wanted to staff the new plant with private employees to help save money in the new plant. Okay. And the union said that uh, breaks civil service protections here in Hawaii, and they sued. Okay, so um, long ago, the uh, county of, on the Big Island, Hawaii mm -hmm. Island, mm -hmm. wanted to save money. And they looked at their uh, waste management and they said, well, maybe we can do a P3 here. Um, and what happened? The, who, who is Kono, by the way? Kono was the, uh, the representative um, for the union at the time. So the representative of the union versus the, the state? The county. The county. Correct. And the judge ruled what? Uh, in favor of the unions. They said that it was violating civil service protections uh, to have this new uh, waste management facility staffed by private employees. Oh, okay. So they tried to privatize in a way, and the state said you can't because there's an old law that says 
that you can't, can't and, the, and the old law is called the civil service protection law? Uh, well, they'll just, uh, it's referred to as the merit principles, okay. which is what the court based their ruling off of. What are merit principles? So merit principles are pretty much the guidelines for civil service protections in Hawaii. And it's essentially to make sure that uh, civil servants don't get fired unjustly, uh, maybe they, they, someone doesn't get passed up on a promotion just because someone else is someone's uncle, and so you can't uh, you can't just hire someone just because they're nephew, they're right. your nephew, and you can't fire someone for no reason. Right. Um, that's called the merit principle, and uh, that's protected under uh, Hawaii law. Mm -hmm. um, am I am I following yes, you so far? That's correct okay. so far. Okay, <laughs> this is a little <laughs> this is a little uh, beyond me, but I think I've got it. Well, the merit principle sounds good. Yeah. So what's the problem? So in their interpretation of the law, the Supreme Court found not only uh, are there these civil per service protections, these logical civil service protections, based on Hawaii's law, any position that has ever been held by a uh, civil servant, a private employee cannot fill those uh, if, if it was ever held by a civil servant or similar positions. So jobs okay. that weren't even created yet. Okay, so the merit principle law, um, although it has very good things that it protects, it might have gone a little too far. And basically it says that if a job has been done previously by a civil service, civil servant, a government civil servant, then uh, it has to continue to be in the future. Yep. For the, all similar jobs as well. Even those jobs that haven't been created yet. Exactly. So let's say I'm, uh, I want to start a uh, waste management uh, facility. Uh, I'm, let's say, the mayor, and I want to start a waste management facility. Um, and I want to hire all private sector workers and management. Uh, that can't be done according to this merit principle law. Correct. That's illegal. So even though you're not displacing any civil servants, which was, that was what the law was designed to make sure people weren't replaced unjustly by private uh, employees, uh, these jobs were never filled by anybody, and they still can't be staffed by private employees because civil servants have done similar work in the past. So that's a huge barrier to anyone who wants to do any kind of P3 or privatization, because you first have to look at, um, well, has this typically been done by government workers in the past? And uh, and there's a lot of, I mean, janitors, for example, there's government workers uh, exactly. who do that. And so if I wanted to privatize the janitorial services in some future department or That'd something, be against the law. That would be against the law. Yep. So, and that's what the judges said. Correct. The and, and they did say that they didn't uh, weigh either, either way that they thought it was good or bad. They said that is just the interpretation of Hawaii's law. Okay. And the I legislature see. does have the power to change that. Okay. So you're saying we're not talking about the Constitution right. here. We're talking about a law, and that law could be changed. Yeah. And so maybe think of it as a door or something. And the door could open, and the door could close, and so on. Well, um, and you're saying that they've done that in the past. Right. So immediately following the Kono decision, uh, this put a bunch of state and county contracts at risk because the state and county did have private employees that were filling positions. And so because uh, they were unclear on whether or not these were legal, uh, there was an act called Act 230. Oh, hang on. Oh. We'll get to Act 230 <laughs> in a second, actually. Um, uh, we're talking with Aaron Leaf. He's a researcher. He's talking about the open and closing of this uh, privatization door in the state, and we're going to learn a lot more about it when we come back in a minute. Hello, I'm Yukari Kunisue. I'm your host of New Japanese Language Show on Think Tech Hawaii, called Konnichiwa Hawaii. Broadcasting live every other Monday at 2 p.m. Please join us where we discuss important and useful information for the Japanese language community in Hawaii. The show will be all in Japanese. Hope you can join us every other Monday at 2 p.m. Aloha. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion. Nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way, there's got to be solution, how to make a brighter day. What do we do? We've got to give a little love, have a little hope, make this world a little better. Try a little more, more than before. Welcome back. 
Uh, I'm Joe Kent, and you're watching Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcasting Network. Um, and as I said, I'm Joe Kent. I'm Vice President of Research at the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. Uh, and I'm filling in for Dr. Keli Akina. He's the President and CEO of the Grassroot Institute. Um, Grassroot is a uh, think tank, and we, re we research uh, solutions to our economy that promote individual liberty and economic freedom. And one of those solutions uh, is uh, something that Aaron Leaf is talking about. He's a researcher at Grassroot. And uh, in one of those solutions is privatization, or P3. Now, before we left, um, you told us about this opening and shutting of this door. Um, and uh, long ago on Hawaii Island, that door was slammed shut. shut and basically, they said that um, it make, it's very difficult from here on to privatize. Is that right? Correct. But sometimes the door has opened. That's right. So right after the Kona decision, uh, when all of these contracts were in question and government services wouldn't have been able to be provided to a bunch of people uh, without those private employees, the legislature passed Act 230. And when was that? That was in 1998. So 1998 that the legislature opened the door. Correct. And what did that do? That just, it just allowed the government to fill civil service servant positions with private employees as long as it doesn't displace any employees. Aha. So uh, as long as we don't disrupt the employees we already have, we can, um, we can put some private sector employees in the mix, right? Exactly. Okay. So public-private partnerships in that sense would have been allowed. Right. Okay, so that's great. So now we have uh, the doors open, right? Well, unfortunately, that was a temporary solution while they figured out what to do. Oh, no, wait a second. I have a feeling the door's going to close again, huh? Yeah. So <laughs> okay. in 2000, Act 253 was passed. Okay. This gave the director of the Department of Human Resources and Development at the state level, he now is the person that has the authority to decide can this job be filled by a private employee, or does it need to be filled by a civil servant? I see. So he's basically the, uh, the deciding factor in a lot of privatization cases. Correct. Okay? And, but uh, the, that kind of still opened the door a little bit, right? Slightly, but he's constrained. He or she is constrained by these guidelines, mm -hmm. um, which are only if a civil servant cannot do the work. Can we have a private employee do it? Okay, so there's a lot of very uh, nuanced uh, things with this with this open door. So where would you say the door is right now? Is it open? Is it closed? Where We've is it? got a little crack. We've it's, got a it's sliver. Yeah. It's, it's, there's a little sliver that you can kind of uh, get in uh, if you meet the certain criteria, and that and that criteria is is it, a civil servant cannot perform that. If there is okay. no civil servant to do it, then we can hire a private employee. So uh, I'm, the, I'm the governor, and uh, I see one of my departments is failing uh, because, and, and it, the reason it's failing is we can't find any other government workers to do it. Right. And in that one scenario, we can privatize. That's true to an extent. There is a list of uh, permanent exemptions, but it's more like um, interns or uh, there's all these positions that couldn't be filled by okay. government employees. So there's a lot of nuance to all this. Right. Um, but uh, well, but the the situation is such that there's a barrier right. to privatization efforts. And is that a good thing or a bad thing in your opinion? So essentially, in order to have a P3 in Hawaii, mm -hmm. in, a law has to be passed for each time it happens. Specifically, okay. just like in the, the Maui Hospital case, they had to pass a law in order to make that happen. I see. And so if, if you wanted to pri uh, do a public-private partnership for, say, uh, um, some other government agency, you have to go back to the legislature and um, go through the whole thing. I, I know with the uh, Maui County Hospital issue, um, I think they took three runs at it before yeah. they got into the end zone. Yep, it took a while. So it takes a long time for a lot of these efforts, right? Right. And so, well, this seems kind of uh, like a lot of hurdles. So what would you propose then? What are some solutions then to solving this problem? Well, uh, I just want to be clear, I'm not a lawyer, so okay. <laughs> I can't give an explicit solution to how to word the law. Uh -huh. you, but, just, you just play one on TV. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But uh, so Act 230, which already, it, it, the, the act I talked about before, mm -hmm. um, which allowed private act employees. In, in 1998. Right. Okay, that opened the door. Right. If we, uh, there were a few and problems. It closed. Right. 
in, in 2001. 2001 is when okay. that expired. So the door opened, now it's closed, and right. you're saying? I'm saying that if we had uh, an, a, a law with similar wording to that, um, we could again have private employees filling certain governmental positions. We could open the door again. Right. Because the door is just a law, right. you're saying. It's not the Constitution. It's just if the legislature, for example, um, found a way to open that door through uh, legislative efforts, they could open it. Correct. Okay, so that's one way to get through. Yep. What are some other ways? So another way to go about it would be, right now, the director of the Department of Human Resources and Development, mm -hmm. this person is in charge of saying who can or cannot be a, uh, which civil servant positions can be filled by private employees. But they have to follow the guidelines of only when no civil servants can do it. If instead, their mission was changed so that they determined which jobs would be better suited uh, and filled by the private sector versus the public sector, mm -hmm. then they would have the power to open that door a little wider. I see. So we've got this uh, director of, de of human resources, and he has a lot of um, basically power over um, privatization efforts. And if that director's uh, mission were were changed to allow for more privatization and public-private partnerships, then we'd go in that direction, kind of vision, visionary way. Right. Right. And there is one more. Mm -hmm. um, there was a law that uh, it was HB 2581 for a public-private partnership um, agency in Hawaii. Okay. Uh, oh, to create an agency. Right. That would help with privatization. Exactly. And P3s. Yep. So that, that okay. law got deferred this year. It didn't okay. make it. All right. Well, uh, did you uh, do a lot of research into that law? I, I didn't know the specifics of that one, no. But a law like, or a, an agency like that um, may or may not help. It's kind of up in the air. Right. Right. There, it, it, what, what, what would be some ways that it would not be able to help? Well, it could cause some crony capitalism. Maybe they would what just is, Okay, be, what is crony capitalism? What does that mean? Crony capitalism is when business uh, comes together with government to uh, guarantee that they have a sector. Essentially, they, they protect that business. The government protects the business, and in return, uh, some politicians will likely be getting some money from that. So you've got uh, peop, uh, businesses with uh, big cigar chomping uh, uh, executives in the back room and, uh, and uh, government in the back room with their cigars, and uh, I guess there's just a lot of cigars in that back room. <laughs> and, and anyways, they're, they're giving each other special deals. Right. Okay, and that's the, that's the wrong way to Correct. do it. Correct. Okay, and the right way? Is to have an open competition, a transparent uh, process where the best company gets it, or sometimes the government can out, outbid the private sector and they can do it for cheaper. Have you ever seen that happen where the government actually does it better than a private company? Yep, actually in Phoenix, Arizona uh, in the 1970s, uh, they decided to open up their trash collection for bidding. And because their, their governmental agency that was doing it was losing a lot of money. It sounds like uh, on the big island almost. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so a private company got the bid at first, but after a couple years, the original agency, the government agency that was in charge, they looked at their plans and they came up with a way to do it even cheaper than that business, and they regained control over ah, it. Ah, so that's an example of the, uh, the pressure yeah. of competition. Um, actually made the government um, compete better and do it faster and, and cheaper and, and better quality. Exactly. That competition, that, that doesn't have to necessarily be a private company doing it, but without that competition, uh, prices just go up. So in Hawaii, uh, what are some of the things that you'd recommend that we do in order to privatize the right way and avoid privatizing the wrong way? Well, personally, uh, I liked Acts 230 and 90 just because uh, they gave a lot of leeway. It was a lot more open. Um, however, there's also the managed competition what, what process. What are um, Acts Act 230 and 90? Those, those that's are, what you talked about before yeah. where we opened the door right. to allow for more privatization. It's just changing the law to let people walk through the door. Right. Okay, got it. And so that's one way. That's and, one way. Mm -hmm. But there's also the managed competition way, uh, which is where uh, essentially you would have the government competing with private companies to provide a service. Okay, so and that's what you talked about in Arizona, where right. we put it up for bid, let the best man do the job, right? right? Okay, well then, what is the, uh, what's the problem with those hurdles? Is it just uh, political hurdles, or maybe information, and 
And how would more, more people find out about this? Well, I guess the biggest thing right now is the Kono ruling is so convoluted and hard to understand, and you have to go back and dig through all of it, that it's hard to push for any political movement when it's so hard to understand. Mm -hmm. So it's just a lot of, uh, basically, information is one of the barriers here to, to public-private partnerships and a better government in Hawaii, is that uh, some people just don't know this solution. Yeah. And it's, it's really hard to talk to the people about the Kono decision, because as we just showed, there's a lot to it, and you can't just sit down and tell someone about it in two minutes. And at the end of the day, what does this mean for Hawaii's government, uh, the, the opportunity of this? Well, it would mean that we could save money by having competition driving down prices, and that would help us pay off our debts. Uh, we could lower taxes, give teachers the raises that they always are asking for. Uh, we just have all this extra money if we were able to do that. You heard it here first. Uh, the way to fix and, uh, and help resolve a lot of uh, Hawaii government problems uh, is just by getting involved in the P3 and privatization conversation uh, and easing r restrictions. Um, and the researcher's name you just heard from is Aaron Leaf. And I'm Joe Kent, Vice President of Research at the Grassroot Institute, uh, filling in for Dr. Kei Akina. Uh, thanks for, so much for watching Hawaii Together. Aloha.